Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Finnegan webcast on standing to appeal to the Federal Circuit from USPTO proceedings. My name is Cora Holt, and I will be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome my co-presenters, Alyssa Lipton and Linda Wadler. Alyssa is a partner in our Boston office. Her practice focuses on trials and appeals and pre-litigation counseling involving a wide range of technologies, including biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device patents. Alyssa has particular experience in litigation arising under the Hatch-Waxman Act and in litigation relating to biologics. Linda is a partner in our Washington, D.C. office. Linda focuses her practice primarily on contentious patent proceedings before the PTO and federal courts and related counseling for clients in the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical device, and cosmetic industries. She has extensive experience representing brand name pharmaceutical patent holders in Hatch-Waxman litigation on commercially successful pharmaceutical products. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate today by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar. Just click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window and click Submit. Time permitting, we will try to answer the questions today during the question and answer session, which will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge Window button at the top right side of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you do experience any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Webcast Help Guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Uh, and with that, I will now turn it over to Alyssa and Linda to begin our presentation. Welcome, Alyssa and Linda. The floor is yours. Hello. This is Linda Wadler, and I'll begin the presentation today. Well, why are we here? Why should you care about a somewhat esoteric issue like Article III standing? Well, for example, without Article III standing, one cannot appeal an adverse patent office decision to the Federal Circuit. And the issue of Article III standing is increasingly being raised in appeals from United States Patent and Trademark Office decisions. So it should be a factor that is considered when one is deciding whether and when to file a post-grant proceeding before the Patent Office, or if you are a patent holder, as a possible tool to use in defending a patent portfolio. For example, one should strategically assess evidence of an injury in fact that could be offered to support Article III standing in any eventual appeal of an adverse decision. So let's first review the basic requirements of Article III standing. What is Article III standing? Well, Article III of the Constitution limits the jurisdiction of federal courts to certain, quote, cases and, quote, controversies. The Supreme Court has maintained that standing to sue must be established in order to meet this case or controversy requirement. Federal courts do not have the power to render advisory opinions, nor to decide questions that cannot affect the rights of the litigants in the case directly before them. So the policy behind Article III standing is premised upon separation of powers principles to prevent the judicial process from infringing upon the powers of other branches of government. So what does one have to do to establish Article III standing? Although it is not at all obvious how the Supreme Court extracted these requirements out of the text of Article III reciting, quote, cases or, quote, controversies, to establish Article III standing, the plaintiff or appellant seeking relief must have suffered an injury in fact, and that injury must be fairly traceable to the challenged conduct of the defendant, and it has to be likely to be redressed by a favorable judicial decision. The injury, in fact, must be concrete, particularized, and actual or imminent, in addition to, again, being traceable to the challenged action and redressable by a favorable ruling. So how has concrete injury been defined? Well, to be concrete, an injury must actually exist and be real, not abstract, but concrete is not necessarily synonymous with tangible. As the Supreme Court has stated, intangible injuries can nevertheless be concrete. Examples of some intangible injuries are reputational injury, or perhaps interference with the freedom of speech or the free exercise of religious beliefs or conduct. 
What does it mean to be particularized? The injury must affect the plaintiff in a personal and individual way and be more than just a general grievance or an abstract harm. So an example of a general grievance could be the expenditure of public funds in an allegedly unconstitutional manner. The Supreme Court has found that it was not an injury sufficient to confer standing, even though the plaintiff contributed to the public coffers as a taxpayer. The requirements for actual or imminent injury relate to certainty and timing. So the threatened injury must be certainly impending and allegations of possible future injury are not enough. Something important to note is that Article III standing is not required for participation in proceedings before the United States Patent Office as, because that is an administrative agency. But on an appeal from a decision by the Patent Office to the Federal Circuit, which is a federal court, the Article III standing requirement kicks in. Can Congress create Article III standing by simply enacting a statute? Well, the Supreme Court has indicated that Congress can create a new legal right by enacting a statute, and the injury from losing that right can create standing even though that injury did not exist before the statute was enacted. But they've also indicated that you still have to show injury, in fact, to meet the Article III standing requirements. Congress cannot statutorily create standing to sue without an injury, in fact. What is the extent of the injury required? Well, the Supreme Court has indicated that you don't have to bet the farm or risk trouble damages in order to satisfy Article III, but the minimum level of injury is not as clear. In situations where the plaintiff is not himself the object of the governmental regulation that he is challenging, standing is not precluded, but it is substantially more difficult to establish. One reason why standing is more difficult to establish in this circumstance is that causation and redressability are often linked to the response of the third party to the government action or inaction being challenged. So the plaintiff would have the burden of establishing facts to show that those third party responses cause him injury and that his suit will permit redressability of that injury. Another policy at play here is that vindicating the public interest is the function of Congress and the chief executive branches of government and not the judiciary. Individual rights are not public rights that have been legislatively pronounced to belong to each individual who forms part of the public. Article III's requirements for immediacy and redressability can be relaxed when Congress passes a statute that gives a party a procedural right to appeal an administrative decision. But the requirement for an injury in fact remains and cannot be removed by statute. For which party is standing examined? Standing to appeal is measured for the party seeking entry to the federal courts for the first time in the lawsuit. So typically the plaintiff in a district court action or the appellant in a appeal. With respect to a patent owner standing, the federal circuit has found that where patent claims are canceled by the Patent and Trademark Appeal Board, there is an alteration of tangible legal rights that is sufficiently distinct and palpable to confer standing under Article III on the patent owner. So now that we have quickly reviewed the fundamental case law on Article III standing, Alyssa will review the statutory right to appeal from various proceedings before the Patent and Trademark Office. Thanks, Linda. We're now going to turn to the statutory basis for parties to appeal from a decision of the PTAB to the Federal Circuit. First, in a PGR or IPR proceeding, Section 141C allows a party to a PGR or IPR proceeding who is dissatisfied with the final written decision of the PTAB to appeal to the Federal Circuit. Note that this right to appeal from these proceedings is reiterated in Sections 319 and 329, which contains similar language. Significantly, 
the appeal must be from a final written decision as opposed to a decision on institution or another non-final ruling. And only dissatisfied parties may appeal. What this means is that if a party receives a favorable decision, it cannot appeal even if it dislikes or disagrees with the reasoning set forth by the PTAB in the opinion. Next, in derivation proceedings, Section 141D provides for appeal to the Federal Circuit. Once again, only a final written decision may be appealed, and only dissatisfied parties may appeal. And though not reproduced here on this slide, a quick reminder that Section 141D provides for potential dismissal of the appeal if an adverse party to the derivation proceeding elects to have further proceedings conducted in district court under 35 U.S.C. Section 146. And while Congress provided a statutory basis for any dissatisfied party to appeal to the Federal Circuit from IPR, PGR, or derivation proceedings, this does not, of course, guarantee that every appellant will have Article III standing before the Federal Circuit. And to sum up, as Linda discussed, the personal audio case gives us really good guidance about categories of parties and whether or not they have to establish standing on appeal. First, an appellate patent owner that has experienced a cancellation of patent claims suffers an injury in fact sufficient for Article III standing purposes. And in a derivation proceeding, the loss of patent rights would be analogous. In contrast, an appellant petitioner who has lost before the PTAB in a PGR or IPR must establish Article III standing requirements. And these are the Federal Circuit cases that we're going to be discussing today where standing has sometimes been challenged. And finally, an appellee does not need to meet Article III standing requirements to defend a judgment of the PTAB in its favor. Moving on to appeals from ex parte cases, Sections 141A and 141B provide for appeal to the Federal Circuit from either examination or re-examination proceedings when there's a final written decision and the applicant or patent owner is dissatisfied with that decision. And though not stated here on this slide, a reminder that Section 141A provides that by filing an appeal to the Federal Circuit, a patent applicant waives the right to conduct further proceedings in district court under Section 145. And as we discussed in the context of an IPR or PGR, based on the Federal Circuit's guidance in the personal audio case, an applicant or patent owner that has experienced rejection or cancellation of patent claims in ex parte proceedings would suffer an injury in fact sufficient for Article III standing purposes. And finally, moving on to intervention, Section 143 provides that the director of the PTO shall have the right to intervene in an appeal of a derivation or IPR PGR proceeding. The Federal Circuit has stated that we follow the Supreme Court's guidance in Quozo that the USPTO may intervene in a later judicial proceeding to defend its decision, even if the private challengers drop out. And now I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Linda to discuss some recent case examples. Okay, well, let's see how the courts have applied these broad case law guidelines and statutory language in practice to specific facts as presented in case law. First, let's look at examples of cases where the Federal Circuit dismissed an appeal for lack of standing. In the Consumer Watchdog versus Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation case, Consumer Watchdog requested an inter-parties re-examination of Worf's patent, which was directed to embryonic stem cell cultures. The PTAB affirmed the patentability of the challenge claims, and Consumer Watchdog appealed that adverse decision to the Federal Circuit. Worf challenged whether Consumer Watchdog had Article III standing to bring the appeal. What was Consumer Watchdog's alleged injury? In sum, Consumer Watchdog alleged that the patent put a severe burden on taxpayer-funded research in California where Consumer Watchdog was located. 
Consumer Watchdog did not have any involvement in research or commercial activities involving the patented embryonic stem cells. And Consumer Watchdog was not an actual or prospective competitor with the patent owner Wharf. Instead, they were a self-described, not-for-profit public charity dedicated to providing a voice for taxpayers and consumers in special interest dominated public discourse, government, and politics. Well, what happened? The Federal Circuit dismissed the appeal for lack of standing. They reasoned that the Patent and Trademark Appeal Board's denial of Consumer Watchdog's request did not invade any legal right conferred upon Consumer Watchdog. The only injury was denial of the particular outcome that Consumer Watchdog desired, and the statute itself did not guarantee a favorable outcome. So Consumer Watchdog was not denied anything to which it was entitled because it was permitted to request reexamination and participate in those proceedings once the Patent Office granted its request. The Federal Circuit also noted that when the plaintiff himself is not the object of the government action he challenges, standing is substantially more difficult to establish. And they reason that the statutory grant of the procedural right to appeal in the IPR statute does not eliminate the requirement that consumer watchdog have a particularized concrete stake in the outcome. The Federal Circuit also considered the estoppel provisions and found that they did not constitute an injury, in fact, because Consumer Watchdog was not engaged in any activity that would give rise to a possible infringement suit. And Consumer Watchdog did not provide any indication in its briefing that it would file another request seeking to cancel Wharf's patent claims at the Patent and Trademark Office. In sum, Consumer Watchdog only alleged a general grievance about the patent's reach and burden on taxpayer-funded research. A sharp opposition to the board's decision and the patent at issue itself is simply not enough to make the dispute justiciable. Turning to the next case, Phygenics v. Immunogen. In this case, Immunogen's patent was directed to methods of treatment of cancers with antibody conjugates and it had exclusively licensed its patent to Genentech for the Kedsila product. Phygenics sought an IPR of Immunogen's patent, and the PTAB issued a final written decision finding the challenged claims not unpatentable. Phygenics appealed that decision to the Federal Circuit, and Immunogen challenged Phygenics' standing to appeal. What was Phygenics' alleged injury? In sum, they alleged that there was, they had suffered economic injury because Immunogen's patent increased the competition between Phygenics and Immunogen. Like Consumer Watchdog, Phygenics did not manufacture any products and did not contend that it faced a risk of infringement or that it was an actual or prospective licensee of the patent at issue. Instead, Phygenics was a self-described for-profit discovery stage biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and biomedical research company that was developing an extensive intellectual property portfolio. Phygenics owned its own patent that it alleged covered both the subject matter of Immunogen's patent and Genentech's activities related to its Kedsila product. And Phygenics contended that Genentech had refused an offer to license Phygenics' patent. In Phygenics, the Federal Circuit provides useful guidance on how one can demonstrate standing. The summary judgment burden of production applies, and where standing is not self-evident, the appellant must supplement the record to substantiate its entitlement to judicial review. So the appellant must either identify record evidence to support standing, or if standing was not an issue before the Patent Office, submit additional evidence at the first appropriate time in response to a motion to dismiss or in the opening brief. The Federal Circuit found that Phygenics did not substantiate its alleged injury with sufficient factual evidence. They indicated that the submitted declarations failed to set forth facts that Immunogen's patent had encumbered Phygenics' licensing efforts. 
Specifically, there was no allegation that Phygenics had ever licensed its patent to anyone, much less to entities that had obtained licenses to Immunogen's patent. The Federal Circuit also indicated that the statutory basis for appeal alone was insufficient to establish an injury in fact for Article III standing. And looking at the estoppel provisions, injury based on estoppel was sufficient here, as in Consumer Watchdog, because Phygenics was not engaged in activity that would give rise to a possible infringement suit. So Alyssa will now discuss a case where the appellant actually was developing a product. Thanks, Linda. And that case is JTAC v. GKN Automotive. JTAC and GKN are competitors in the business of the design and manufacture of automotive systems. GKN has a patent directed to a drivetrain for a four-wheel drive vehicle. JTACT was in the process of developing a product with similar technology and sought IPR of GKN's patent. The PTAB issued a final written decision finding certain challenge claims not unpatentable, and JTACT appealed that adverse decision to the Federal Circuit. J GKN filed a motion with the Federal Circuit to dismiss the appeal for lack of standing. The motions panel denied the motion, and deemed it the better course for the parties to address the standing issue in their briefs. As the party seeking judicial review, JTAC had the burden of establishing standing. JTAC submitted two declarations in support of standing, one from JTAC's chief engineer and another from a JTAC patent engineer. In these declarations, JTAC relied on a potential risk of infringement and also potential estoppel effects. JTAC conceded that its product was in development and was not finalized and that it would continue to evolve. And because its product was still in development, JTAC stated that it could not definitively say whether or not it would infringe GKN's patent and the potential risk of infringement was impossible to quantify at that time. The Federal Circuit found that JTAC lacked standing to appeal and dismissed the appeal. The Federal Circuit stated, where the party relies on potential infringement liability as a basis for injury in fact, but is not currently engaging in infringing activity, it must establish that it has concrete plans for future activity that creates a substantial risk of future infringement or would likely cause the patentee to assert a claim of infringement. The Federal Circuit further found that estoppel provisions are not an injury in fact when the appellant is not engaged in any activity that would give rise to a possible infringement suit, and the court cited to the consumer watchdog and Phygenics cases. JTAC filed a combined petition for panel rehearing and rehearing en banc, and the Federal Circuit denied that petition. JTAC also filed a motion to stay the mandate in view of a forthcoming petition for cert that JTAC intended to file with the Supreme Court. The Federal Circuit denied the motion for a stay and the mandate issued on October 12th. We have not yet seen JTAC's petition for cert appear on the docket, but we will be watching for this one. So Consumer Watchdog, Phygenics, and JTAC have given us quite a bit of additional guidance from the Federal Circuit on standing in appeals from the PTO. And what we've seen from these cases is that the Federal Circuit typically has required the appellant to show that it has engaged or will likely engage in an activity that would give rise to a possible infringement suit. I think it's important to also keep in mind that in the MedImmune case, the Supreme Court gave us some additional guidance that for purposes of declaratory judgment jurisdiction and Article III, contractual rights that are affected by a patent validity determination may be sufficient for Article III purposes. And as Linda discussed, it's also important for appellants to keep in mind the guidance that the Federal Circuit provided in Phygenics that if the record before the PTAB does not contain sufficient information to support standing, 
the appellant must supplement the record at the first available opportunity by submitting affidavits or other evidence. We're now going to turn to a case in which the Federal Circuit found that standing was established. This case is Altair Pharmaceuticals v. Paragon Biotech. And Altair is a company that manufactured phenylephrine products. Phenylephrine contains a chiral center that can be in one of two enantiomer forms, either R or S, and the R enantiomer is useful to dilate pupils. The relative amounts of each enantiomer in a sample can be measured, and this measurement is referred to as chiral purity. Altair entered into an agreement with Paragon in order to seek FDA approval for Altair's products. Under the agreement, Paragon prepared and submitted new drug applications for drug products made by Altair. During the FDA approval process for one of these products, FDA suggested that Paragon consider adding a chiral purity test to the drug product specification. Altair and Paragon performed some testing to measure the chiral purity of Altair's drug products, and this information was submitted to the FDA, which approved the product. Paragon then used this information generated during the FDA approval process to file a patent on methods of using a composition having greater than 95% chiral purity for pupil dilation. In response, in April 2015, Altair ultimately filed suit against Paragon in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. The suit alleged that Paragon had breached the nondisclosure provision of the party's agreement. Paragon countered that Altair had breached the nondisclosure provision and also sought a declaratory judgment that it had the right to terminate the agreement. Two years later, in April 2017, Altair filed a separate suit in the Eastern District seeking a declaratory judgment of invalidity of Paragon's patent for failure to name an inventor and sought correction of inventorship. Meanwhile, Altair also sought PGR of the claims of Paragon's patent. The PTAB issued a final written decision that Altair had failed to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the challenge claims would have been obvious, and Altair appealed that decision to the Federal Circuit. Paragon filed a motion to dismiss with the Federal Circuit, asserting that Altair lacked Article III standing. And once again, the Federal Circuit determined that the better course was to deny the motion and that the party should address standing in their briefs. As the party seeking judicial review, Altair had the burden of establishing standing. Altair argued before the Federal Circuit that it had standing because it faced an imminent risk of suit and was suffering reputational injury based on Paragon's alleged misappropriation of Altair's invention. In order to support standing, Altair submitted a declaration from its general counsel. The declaration explains that Altair intended to resume marketing of its product in the event that the agreement with Paragon was terminated, as sought by Paragon in one of the Eastern District litigations. The declaration explains that Altair believed Paragon would sue Altair for infringement of the Paragon patent upon Altair filing an abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA, with the FDA. Thus, Altair argued that Paragon's patent was blocking Altair from selling its own product and that it faced an imminent risk of suit. Paragon responded that Altair's future plans to engage in infringing activities were at most contingent and that any reputational injury could not be remedied by PGR. The Federal Circuit found many of Altair's arguments to be persuasive and found that Altair had sufficiently demonstrated imminent harm. The Federal Circuit concluded that Altair's injury was inevitable. Paragon was actively seeking a declaratory judgment that it had the right to terminate the contract between the parties. Even if the contract was not terminated, the contract by its terms was set to expire in 2021, so in three years. Once the contract terminated, Altair planned to file an ANDA to resume marketing its products, and the court also noted that Paragon had refused to stipulate that it would not sue Altair for infringement of Paragon's patents. The Federal Circuit found Altair's harm to be concrete and particularized. 
the Federal Circuit reasoned that Paragon's patent was a block to Altair's filing and approval of an ANDA. The Federal Circuit found Altair's injury to be compounded by estoppel under Section 325E2, because in this case, unlike in Consumer Watchdog or Phygenics, Altair was engaged in an activity that could potentially give rise to an infringement suit. The court was, however, careful to note that it was not deciding if such potential estoppel effects are sufficient independently to establish standing. The majority opinion in the Altair case was authored by Judge Wallach and joined by Judge O'Malley. Judge Shaw issued a dissent in the case. Judge Shaw explained that he would have dismissed the case for lack of standing. In Judge Shaw's view, there was no demonstrated imminent harm. He pointed out that Altair cannot infringe Paragon's patent during the term of the agreement because by its terms, the agreement precluded Altair from manufacturing its products. Given that the agreement was not set to terminate for another three years, in Judge Shaw's view, there was not sufficient basis for a finding of imminent harm. Judge Shaw also found that the breach of contract suit was too uncertain to support imminent harm. And in sum, because any threat of a patent infringement suit was contingent upon termination of the agreement, in Judge Shaw's view, the facts of the case did not support a finding of imminent harm. We want to note that there are two additional cases where standing has been challenged in an appeal to the Federal Circuit and the court has found Article III standing to be present. The first case is PPG Industries v. Valspar Sourcing, and this was decided in February of 2017 and more recently in the DuPont v. Sinvina case decided in September 2018. It's worth noting that in the PPG case, although the court found standing was present based on PPG's sale of a commercial product and concern of a potential infringement suit expressed by a customer, the court found that the appeals were mooted by a covenant not to sue provided by Valspar. Interestingly, the court found that because Valspar's unilateral action in offering the covenant not to sue mooted the appeals, the appropriate course was for the court to vacate the PTAP decision. And there are additionally some currently pending cases that we want to highlight because of the interesting arguments that have been raised by the parties in those cases. The first case is Momenta Pharmaceuticals v. Bristol Myers Squibb. Oral argument in this case was held before the Federal Circuit almost a year ago in December 2017. And as we will get to, there's reason to think we may not get a decision from the Federal Circuit in this case, but we think still worth taking a look at the party's arguments. Bristol Myers has a patent that claims stable liquid formulations of CTLA-4 immunoglobulin and covers the Arencia product approved for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Momenta had begun development of a biosimilar to Arencia and sought IPR of all claims of BMS's patent. The PTAB issued a final written decision finding the challenge claims not unpatentable. Momenta then appealed this decision to the Federal Circuit. At the time of the appeal, Momenta had not yet filed an ABLA with the FDA, and a Phase I clinical trial had failed to meet primary pharmacokinetic endpoints. On appeal, Momenta argued that it suffered individualized concrete harm sufficient to cross the Article III threshold. Momenta said that the PTO's refusal to cancel the BMS patent was a roadblock to Momenta's development program. Momenta said that it suffered monetary harm from having to alter business plans and that this constituted a concrete and particularized loss, not some abstract generalized grievance. And Momenta also pointed to the AIA's estoppel provision, Section 315E, as providing harm to Momenta. Momenta also argued that the immediacy and reality test does not apply to appeals from an agency action, and that in this context, economic injury is sufficient, unlike in a DJ action. Finally, Momenta requested vacator of a PTAB decision if the Federal Circuit were to hold that Momenta did not have standing to appeal. And BMS cited to the Federal Circuit's um, Sandoz v. Amgen case as well 
On the next slide, BMS in response argued that Momenta's alleged injury is hypothetical, not concrete, and based on a chain of contingencies that may not occur. BMS argued that Momenta's product's design was uncertain. Momenta may never file an application with the FDA, and if it did, the FDA may force Momenta to change its product. There was no concrete threat of infringement liability, only hypothetical future economic injuries. BMS argued that the BPCIA trumps the applicability of the later enacted AIA. And in BMS's view, the BPCIA reflected Congress's judgment that timely adjudication of patent disputes over biosimilars begins when the FDA application is filed. And the current status of this case is uncertain at this time. In some filings on the docket recently, Momenta stated that it had initiated discussions to exit its participation in the development of a proposed biosimilar to Arencia and said that it would promptly inform the court of any outcome of its discussions that might affect this court's ongoing jurisdiction. And BMS responded that in its view, Momenta's voluntary discontinuance of its experimental product would both moot the appeal and preclude vacator of the PTAB's decision. I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Linda to discuss the next case. Well, finally, let's briefly turn to the RPX v. Shanbon case on standing because the Supreme Court currently is in the process of deciding whether or not it should consider this case. As a brief background, RPX is a for-profit company that acquires patent rights to resolve patent disputes and challenges the validity of, quote, low-quality patents that are asserted by non-practicing entities. RPX does not manufacture or sell products, so it has not been accused of infringing the patented issue. RPX initiated an IPR of Shanbon's patents but lost. The final written decision held that RPX had not shown that the claims were unpatentable. RPX appealed to the Federal Circuit and Shanbond moved to dismiss the appeal for lack of standing. And the Federal Circuit did dismiss the appeal for lack of standing because it stated RPX is not engaged in any activity that would give rise to a possible infringement suit. RPX petitioned for certiorari to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court recently has called for the views of the Solicitor General in deciding whether or not to grant certiorari. Before we look at what RPX argued in its petition, first let me tell you what RPX did not argue. In opposing Shanbon's motion to dismiss before the Federal Circuit, RPX had argued that its standing relative to its competitors was injured, as well as its reputation for successfully challenging patents in IPR proceedings. RPX dropped those injury arguments in its petition for cert and chose to focus on its arguments concerning the alleged violation of its statutory procedural rights. So specifically, RPX argued in its petition that the Federal Circuit's attachment of the injury in fact analysis to patent infringement activities impermissibly deviates from precedent regarding Congress's power to statutorily create Article III standing. RPX further argued that the invasion of the AIA statutor statutorily created rights concerning IPR proceedings should constitute an injury in fact sufficient for Article III standing. More specifically, RPX first argued um, regarding sec uh, sections 318 and 315. 318 creates a statutory right for any petitioner who meets the burden of un unpatentability to have the director cancel the unpatentable patent claims. Section 315E1 is the estoppel provision which stops a petitioner in an IPR from requesting or maintaining a proceeding on any ground that the petitioner raised or reasonably could have raised during the IPR proceedings. So IPX first argued that sections 318 and 315 created new private rights, the invasion of which are in injuries in fact that were sufficient to create Article III standing. 
In addition, RPX also pointed to Section 319. Section 319 states, a party dissatisfied with the final written decision of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board may appeal the decision, and it states any party to the inter-parties review shall have the right to be a party to the appeal. RPX argued that Section 319 indicates that Congress intended any party dissatisfied with a final written decision to be able to appeal. And this dissatisfaction alone was sufficient injury in fact, because it related to a specific and actual final written decision, so it was concrete. It affected RPX as a party in a personal way, so it was particularized. And the right to appeal was limited in time and scope, so it was actual or imminent. RPX also argued that Congress knew how to identify the class of parties who may file a challenge or appeal regarding a patent and how to limit that group when it wanted to. Specifically, RPX contrasted the broad language of Section 319 with Congress's expressed decisions elsewhere in the AIA statute to, one, not allow appeal of PTAB decisions to not institute an IPR proceeding, and two, to limit the availability of CBM proceedings to only patents charged with infringement. Before we get to Shanbon's arguments, I wanted to briefly mention two amicus briefs filed that partially supported RPX. The first was an amicus brief of Ask Ladin, which argues that non-defendant petitioners like RPX and Ask Ladin are particularly important to the effective operation of IPR processes and that the estoppel provisions, in its view, were not meant to function without the safeguard of appellate review. The amicus brief of the New York Intellectual Property Law Association argued that the Supreme Court should accept RPX's petition specifically to determine whether dissatisfaction with adverse final written decisions under Section 319 is a sufficient intangible injury for Article III standing to appeal. They argued that the Federal Circuit's failure to even consider whether Congress defined a petitioner's dissatisfaction with the final written decision as a sufficient injury in fact to appeal was clear error and contrary to the Supreme Court's precedent in the Spokeo case. In Shanbon's opposition to RPX's petition, they, are, they had um, three broad arguments. One, they argued that RPX waived its argument that the statutory provision 319 for appeal does provide an injury in fact sufficient for Article III standing. They contend that on, the only statutory provisions raised and considered below were sections 315 and 318. Next, Shanbon argued that RPX's petition was a poor vehicle for the Supreme Court to review the standing issue because it was limited to such a narrow group of third-party challengers. Those challengers were in the business of challenging the validity of patents only to improve patent quality and didn't impact, um, according to Shanbon, patent owners and the majority of petitioners who are typically concurrently defendants in infringement actions who have standing. Finally, Shanbon argued that the Federal Circuit's decision was consistent with precedent. They first pointed to Supreme Court cases, which they allege support the propositions that um, a bare violation of a statute or a presence of a disagreement is typically not sufficient to establish injury in fact to satisfy the Article III standing requirements, that Article III requires a concrete injury even for statutory violations, and they contended that patent quality was a public concern, not a concrete right particular to RPX. And then they argue that any injury from estoppel was hypothetical because RPX was not subject to an infringement suit and didn't meet causation requirements because estoppel was triggered upon the issuance of a final written decision, whether the outcome of that decision was to uphold or to um, invalidate the patent. Shanbon also pointed to Eighth and D.C. Circuit precedent 
and they contended that those circuits um, support the proposition that the loss of a dispute alone is not sufficient for an injury in fact because that would transform every dispute with an agency into one that is reviewable in a federal court. And they also argued that RPX's arguments would improperly allow Congress to modify constitutional standing requirements to create federal jurisdiction. So where does that leave us? Well, at the present time under federal circuit precedent, one needs facts outside of the statute itself to support standing, and the road to establishing a sufficient injury, in fact, is not always clear. However, if the Supreme Court takes up RPX, and if the Supreme Court eventually agrees with RPX's arguments, the statute alone would be enough to create standing for appeal. So the upcoming year should prove to be interesting. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alyssa and Linda. Before we begin the question and answer portion of our event, I want to remind everyone to please take a moment to complete the brief evaluation survey. As we strive to provide programs of value and continually improve, we would greatly appreciate your input, which will guide us in planning future programs. Uh, we'll turn now to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just click on the Q&A button and type your question into the Q&A window and click Submit. So the first question we have relates to the RPX case, so maybe, Linda, you can handle this one. When is the Solicitor General's position on granting the petition for certiorari due? Well, as is typical, the Supreme Court did not set a court-imposed deadline for filing on the Solicitor's Office. We understand that the Solicitor General's Office, as a matter of practice in the past, when responding to calls for the views of the Solicitor General issued by the Supreme Court in the fall, generally files its responsive brief before or in December so that the case ideally could be decided before the court summer recess. Um, so if, um, you know, past practice, um, if, if the Solicitor General's office um, continues consistent with its past practice, we would be looking for their brief sometime before Christmas. Okay. Um, our next question, do you have any suggestions for how to prepare and submit declarations in order to establish standing? Um, I'll answer that question. Um, what we've seen from these cases is that the content of the declarations has been incredibly important to the Federal Circuit judges. And the Phygenics case gives us quite a bit of guidance on the procedure for submitting evidence in support of standing. Um, and as we stated earlier, if standing is challenged, the appellant should identify evidence in the record or submit additional evidence to the appeals court as soon as possible. And because a petitioner doesn't need to establish standing in order to participate before the patent office, often this, this additional information does need to be submitted on appeal. Um, given that the summary judgment burden of production applies in these cases, the Federal Circuit and Phygenic cited to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 56C4 as setting forth the requirements of a declaration. And Rule 56C4 provides that a declaration used to support a motion must be made on personal knowledge, it must set out facts that would be admissible in evidence, and it must show that the declarant is competent to testify on the matters stated. So in other words, practitioners should follow the federal rules of evidence and lay the requisite foundation for the statements being made and should make sure that the declaration does not recite conclusions of law or make conclusory statements without providing the underlying facts based on the declarant's personal knowledge. And this is something that the judges really are looking at, so it's, it's important to make sure to follow all of these rules. Um, something else that's important to note is that if standing is challenged on appeal, the appellant may have only 10 days to respond to a motion to dismiss the appeal. For this reason, it's important for the appellant to begin considering the standing issue as soon as possible and pull together evidence early in the process. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. 
Uh, another question is, are there any examples of statutory relaxation of the immediacy and reality requirement, requirements of Article III in the patent context? There are a couple of other examples in the patent context, and one good example is the Hatch-Waxman statute, which creates an artificial act of infringement by filing of an ANDA with the FDA. And the statute provides an explicit basis for litigation before any actual infringement occurs. Um, that's because the ANDA is filed before the generic drug company has begun to market the drug. Um, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act of 2009, the BPCIA, extended this provision to biologics as well. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Uh, with that, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webcast on standing to appeal to the Federal Circuit from PTO proceedings. The presentation will be available on demand next week, so please look for a, an email from us with the access link. Thank you all very much for participating, and with that, we conclude today's webcast.